discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. We're about a year away from the latest in public transportation in Hampton Roads. The Tide, also known as Light Rail, opens its trains for passengers in May of 2011. According to the latest census, almost 70% of public transportation users in Hampton Roads are African American, and that trend is expected to extend to Tide ridership. Now, Light Rail has brought challenges and opportunities to Norfolk and the region, and here to talk about it is Tamara Paulson, Community Outreach Coordinator for Hampton Roads Transit, and Bruce Williams, CEO of A. Bruce Williams & Associates and Vice President of the Conference of Minority Transportation Officials, Hampton Roads Chapter. Welcome to the program, you guys. How you Thank doing? Thank you. Well, right. you. You got a long title, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> That's just some more to it, but I tell I know, that. exactly. <laughs> You know, we've there's been lots of discussion about the um, management, about the money, about the schedules, and all of that for light rail. But we haven't had a big discussion about the people, and that's what I, we want to talk about tonight. Who's riding the tide? Who's riding public transportation now? And what should they expect coming up? Let me start with you, Tamara. Um, well, everyone's going to ride the tide. We're very optimistic about it coming into Hampton Roads and coming into the region being another form of transportation, um, providing people with more accessibility and mobility along the 262 corridor between Norfolk and Virginia Beach. So everyone's going to ride it. Seniors, elderly, black, white, everyone is going to be open for everyone to ride. Mm -hmm. But in, in terms of your ridership right now, it, do you not have a majority of African Americans that use public transportation across the board? True. On our bus system, we do have a predominantly um, African American population that uses the, the trains and, I mean, the buses now. Mm -hmm. We do. Now, Bruce, I know you've done some research with, with, the, um, with HRT and with others in terms of talking to neighborhoods about um, the tide coming, talking to citizens, and so forth. What's the overall attitude about it? Well, we initially did the initial. SEIS for Norfolk Light Rail. And we got a chance to talk to a lot of civic leagues, a lot of stakeholders, churches, individual groups, college students and whatnot. First of all, there was a whole misconception of what it was. Mm -hmm. Then there was a kind of a throwback on the on the technology. It's in a sense we're kind of everything old is new again. Mm -hmm. At one time we had trolley lines running all through Hampton Roads going out to the beachfront and going up to Oceanside and the else. And mm -hmm. in fact the United States of America fifty years ago ripped up eight thousand miles of rail to hmm. put buses in place. Now, some people say part of that was to make more buses and sell more gasoline, but the fact of the matter is, systems throughout the country were ripped up and changed over the bus. Mm -hmm. But the change of the economy, the changes of scale, the way we developed ourselves economically, the way we need to develop ourselves in terms of reducing urban sprawl, urban sprawl mm -hmm. has brought this back, this technology back in full, in full in the new form. I've ridden the systems in St. Louis, in Charlotte, in Baltimore, uh, in Not San Diego, <laughs> uh, and when you've got a place like St. Louis, which is probably one of the most parochial places in the country, mm -hmm. which has a light rail system that they love, and then that takes them to the airport, takes them downtown. In fact, they have a situation where at lunchtime, it's free for people to ride from Grand Central mm. Station to downtown and back. We have, we have an area like that, which has individual town cities that have invested in this type of technology. You have to take a look at the fact that it's an option that is now in the, in the fore and needs to be put in place here. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when the rail the rail line was was designed and so forth there's one stop that's a pedestrian stop is am i saying that correctly it's Tamara a neighborhood walk up a neighbor station. a neighborhood walk up station correct. and that's the ingleside neighborhood correct and there's been some um a lot of working with the community with the ingleside community to make sure that they're comfortable with the stop mm -hmm. being in their neighborhood now if you watch our commercial brethren and the mm -hmm. news coverage that's right. been going on there seems to be and, and you guys correct me if you think this perception is wrong, but there seems to be a divide in that community along racial lines in terms of whether or not the tide is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, now, what they show is every time there's a problem about, about the, the concern about traffic or transportation and so forth, they usually have an African-American um, there who's talking about those concerns, as opposed to a white person who is saying, this is great, I can jump on the train, I can go downtown, I can have my dinner, come back, and don't have to worry about traffic. Is that perception correct? 
Um, I can't speak to how it was when they first did the draft, you know, the studies and things like that. Um, I came into the picture about April of last year when I started working with the Ingleside Civic League very closely, attending their meetings monthly um, to just pretty much update them on construction and things that were going on in the community. And I think the biggest um, challenge has been just the fact that something new was going to be in their community. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem to me um, that there was a racial divide. It seemed that everyone was concerned about the fact that public transportation was going to be coming right through the community. Um, there were some safety concerns, um, some things about infrastructure that was going to change in the community. And I think we've all worked together, HRT, the city of Norfolk, um, and the Civic League, mm -hmm. um, to kind of address those concerns. So I think it was more so that everyone was concerned in the community, black, white, everyone was concerned. Why is this one a walk up? And, and I'll get right to you, Bruce. But why is this one a, a walk up as opposed to other stations that will be park and rides? Or, or feed in from other transportation? Some of modes. the um, stations will have parking rides affiliated with mm -hmm. them. Um, this particular station is for the neighborhood, it's for the community, um, and it's the FTA mandate that you have a station that serves a neighborhood. FTA, um, Federal Transportation. Our Federal Transit, uh, okay. industry That's okay. speak. <laughs> um, it, it is a mandate, and we felt like this was a good neighborhood where we could bring that to. So mm -hmm. um, it is something that will serve the community. It is a walk-up station, and it is something that we feel like will be good for the area. What are some of the advantages? Well, the flip side of this, too, mm -hmm. we, did, we did the SEIS, and we were in Ingleside. In fact, I remember holding the, the ESCIS at the Ingleside Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we did Explain that. what ECIS is. The, the, the SEIS, SEIS is the, <laughs> the, supplemental environment, the, the Supplemental Environmental Impact Study. Okay. It's the thing you do first when you're applying with the federal government for the funds, which is 80% of the funds, to fund the construction of the project. Mm -hmm. And back then, quite frankly, there were a lot of things that were adjusted. The, the, the yard was in a different place, we're planning to be in a different place. Mm -hmm. It was running around to where Barry Robinson was. There was a lot of things that changed from that point in time. So it was a long period of time. And a lot of times with a project like this one, where there's a long window of planning, the characters change. I mean, we've had changes to presidents mm -hmm. in Norfolk State University, mm -hmm. which yes. caused some issues. We had changes to people who live in the area. We have, and we had folks who didn't ever think it was going to arrive. It would never happen. True. But now the, reality, now is the here, reality is here. And yeah. now with Always that reality, here. Suddenly, folks say, "Oh, I got to get some input in this," right. which mm -hmm. is fair. Mm -hmm. But they should also look at from the flip side: a park and ride in that community would maybe more disrupt that community's character than a walk up. It would mean, for example, the the um, acquisition of homes and property to put a parking lot there. Mm -hmm. It would mean a change in your traffic flow. I mean, during the SEIS, not only are you doing uh, civic league and stakeholder and organizational meetings and whatnot. You're also doing traffic flow and pattern. You're doing water. You're doing uh, environmental noise abatement. All of those things are part of the process of that route structure. I can imagine, well, though, for, for those people who, where that train is going to go right by their front door, Correct. I mean, literally, right. right by their front door, that that was kind of scary. How did you help allay those fears? Well, one of the things is we kept a constant conversation going on with the community. Um, when we started construction, we developed a 1-800 number where people can call directly, and we would answer very promptly. And we made sure that every phase of construction that we've been going through, we had community input, and we let them know what was going to happen. This mm -hmm. is what you'll see tomorrow. This is what you'll see in a couple of months. This is what you can expect to hear at night. This is what you can expect to hear during the day. So there's, there's a constant conversation that's between HRT, between the city, between the community, letting them know what's going to happen in your neighborhood along the whole process. And I think that's been important to them. Okay. And the other issue is marketability. I mean, if you look at any transit system in America, if you can walk to a transit infrastructure that takes you downtown on one fare reliably, mm -hmm. That is a, a that's a that's a, a benefit that people now are paying very big dollars for. And why why do you think that switch has changed, Bruce? Because we were talking before the show about kind of there's mm -hmm. a mental uh, switch that's going on yeah. in people's heads also in terms of public transportation. Well, it's economics. At one point in time, we had a situation where everyone lived downtown and lived in the city. I mean, you see the pictures like in King Kong with the L's running around and people riding <laughs> in the train all packed up. And people's images of that seem to lay into what they think mass transit is. And then mm -hmm. there was the, the, the urban, fl the suburban flight. People moved out to the suburbs mm -hmm. and drove out there. And, and in fact, newspapers moved out there and industry moved out there and development moved out there. And gas was 90 cents, 99 cents a gallon. Gas is not 99 cents a gallon anymore. And what was that? <laughs> and, and, and that's way back then. 
But the mentality was based on that. Right. Cheap mm -hmm. fossil fuel that I can drive my car anywhere I want to. Right. And I, you know, and, and, and I have an interstate system that was built. Mm -hmm. Right. Remember the mm -hmm. 50s to 60s, mm -hmm. we built the interstate system. Mm -hmm. Now we find that travel times have gone up three, four hundred percent. That because I remember, and mainly you're sitting in traffic. You're right? sitting in traffic. Right. Gas is running almost three dollars a gallon. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost of operating and maintaining a car is Same such thing. that it's gone through the roof. And see, we see this, you know, I'm a member of CONF, I'm also a member of 20 plus men. And we have an economic justice committee. We see this as an economic justice issue. You got Explain that. Student goes to Norfolk State trying to work his way through college. There are jobs at the beachfront waiting for him to work and they're looking for, and people out at the beach looking to hire. Mm -hmm. He cannot reliably or she cannot reliably get to that job right now in a transportation system. It takes three hours to get from one of, the, of our community to the other end, and you can't guarantee it. No fault of HRT, because we fund our HRT funding 30% from the cities, 30% from the government, and 30% from everywhere else. We pay for the system we want. Right. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if I'm a student and I'm trying to work my way through college, like I worked my way through college when I was in New York, I, I, can't, reliably, <laughs> I can't reliably get to that job unless I got a car. Now, if that That's car right. thing, puts a whole nother economic strain on me. Sure, because now student. you've got to take care of the car, you've got to have the gas for the car, you've got to pay for the car. And mm -hmm. since you know, we go back into African American history, take a look at the, at, the, at the development of the black community in terms of its economic power and its wealth generation mm -hmm. and lack thereof, frankly speaking, a person who was of my, of my age, and my uh, MBA and whatnot, makes 10 cents of a dollar to his white counterpart in terms of wealth. Mm -hmm. So from wealth generation standpoint, being the ability to have access to the opportunity is just as important as getting opportunity. And exactly. transportation provides the access. And transportation is going to do that. Let's talk a little bit about the economic um, uh, advantages or, or opportunities that come along with light rail, particularly for um, DBEs or disadvantaged business enterprises. Funny you should bring that up. One of the mm -hmm. things that came up with some of the things that have occurred is that Compto wanted to see where the dollars were. So we issued a FOA request, friendly, mm -hmm. to see where the dollars were going and who was being spent with what. It turns out $24 million has been spent with women-owned, minority-owned firms on, on, the light, on the Norfolk light rail system so far. Mm -hmm. African-American male and African-American female-owned firms have earned $14 million of that 24, That's some 60%. 60%. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. African American women firm, women owned firms, I think it's 37 percent of that, mm -hmm. and 20 percent of African American male firms. Mm -hmm. Now we haven't checked to see who really got checked. I mean, that's what it says, <laughs> and how percentage of the entire project. But it's encouraging that at least on the on this particular project, that there are there is participation being involved, and, and there Tamara, are firms that are being. And that participation happens through subcontractors, through major contractors. Where, where does that come from? Through subcontractors, we advertise in the communities and let them know that we have contracts out for bid, and we invite DBE contractors to come in, just like with any other contractor, to place bids on those contracts, and we award them either through the main contracts or through subcontractors. And mm -hmm. we've been very successful with meeting our, um, meeting and exceeding our compliance with our DBE contractors. Okay. So and we're very happy about that. But Bruce, aren't there some other opportunities once light rail is actually in place and running in terms of businesses that sprout up around? the system? Well, this is the biggest misconception. The only, as I understand it, the only transit system in the world that supports itself on its own funds is Hong Kong. I've been to Hong Kong and you have millions of people really, yeah. who That's ride that ride system. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. The other thing is it's a backbone of a system. This right. is a starter line. By putting an infrastructure in that gives you 15 minute intervals on travel, it creates a backbone. And for example, Charlotte, who has the links running now, which mm -hmm. is very successful, has rearranged all of their bus schedules to link with the links with schedule. With the train. Exactly. So that, so that the buses arrive at the time so people can get off the bus and get right, right. onto the train. Exactly. Uh, what we call intermodal. Okay. And is that what the plan system. is? And that is we will have an upgraded um, bus system that will connect with the trains and, and, and bring people in. You know, and like Bruce was saying, it's not just about being able to um, walk up to a neighborhood station. It's about being able to access other stations with the parking rides. We drive to the free parking rides, park your car there, or ride your bike there. You can take bikes on the train. So it's about mm -hmm. being fully intermodal, and it's a part of a system, a larger transportation system. For and this transportation mm -hmm. has to be one that has vision to take us as far as Williamsburg to the north, Mm -hmm. Chesapeake to the south, so as far as Suffolk to the west and the beach to the east, because that option has happen? to be in place. How long do you think it'll take before that happens? Or do you believe that it will ultimately 
connect all of Hampton Roads? I believe that given the interest now, not only in light rail, but what we saw with a thousand people showing up to a hearing for high speed rail, right. and the mm -hmm. fact that that's going to be brought to Southside Norfolk, the mm -hmm. region did something unusual for its history. They came around and made a decision on one route, one location, for the good yeah. of the region. That has never been done before. Mm -hmm. If we can get that kind of thinking going toward creating options for true transportation accessibility in this region, we will move where we need to move and we will mitigate some of the problems that are being brought by the Navy in terms of quality of life. Mm -hmm. They're being brought by our tourism elements, our assets. Okay. They're being brought up by our economic development assets. You can economically develop along a rail line or along a light rail line economically and create the kind of environment that both is green as well as efficient as well as effective. What kind of businesses normally spring up around a light rail line or, or a high speed rail line? Actually all matter. types, but usually mm -hmm. you, know, you, you really get uh, support, uh, high tech support. Mm -hmm. um, we have a sim simulation technology situation. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's important about a transportation system is it connects people. And connecting right. people connects ideas and connects abilities. It's a lot easier for me to think about running over to you in Newport News if it's a 30 minute ride on the train and back than a three hour ride through the tunnel. That is the difference between the, 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 the merging of ideas and creating commerce. Mm -hmm. And we see that right now. People make decisions on whether they're going to go to a meeting or not as to what the, tra what the tunnel's going to look like. Exactly. Which way? You exactly. Go. Which way are you going to go? Which way you and go? how soon do you need to leave exactly. before before your meeting to see if you can if you can make it there? And once you put that constraint on industries that are generated by creative thought and and and, and, and uh, I think Deborah DeCroce said it. Dr. DeCroce said mm -hmm. collaborations. Mm -hmm. You make collaboration more difficult. Mm -hmm. You stunt economic growth. I was at a meeting um, not too long ago, and people were talking about how do you get that business person to ride the train because what they the feeling was once you see the guy in the suit on the train that everybody else will follow back to the whole perception of right. who rides the trains is that a concern typically studies show that um, your business people are the ones who will be riding the train they will be taking it to work they'll be taking it to meetings they'll be taking it to the mall they'll be taking it to special events you know in this case downtown um, so you typically already have that in place where you have that middle income to higher income people that will be using um, rail transit mm -hmm. so that's something you'll already see and I think it's just going to it's going to be the same in this area as well we have some drivers too if, for example, you take hub zones, hub zones are historically unutilized business zones, mm -hmm. where you have defense contractors that have located those hub zones. Mm -hmm. Well, you got a connection to the base by way of light rail. I don't have to move the car. I don't have to go through that. That mm -hmm. security issue is different than if I have to drive a car on the base. Right. 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 Immediately you change right. the, you change the, the, the you change the dynamic. Right. You know, the dynamics about this thing, if this was, as we were talking about water with Lake Gaston, mm -hmm. the issue would be seen a lot clearer than we see it now. It's almost like a slow boil. You put a frog in a slow boil and let it boil, it'll get used to the heat and die. Whereas if you throw him in immediately, he knows he's boiling. Right. When we had our water crisis in Virginia Beach, it was clear we had a water crisis and we dealt with it. The problem is we've had difficulty getting people to understand we have a transportation crisis. That's the true. governor understood we had a transportation crisis because when the potholes came, look how fast they got filled. Mm -hmm. Understand mm -hmm. that we are in a new age and we have to create other options for people to move around this region if we're going to have this region survive. How much will it cost? Right now we're at $338 million, so. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. And, and I, I, got, like, I got Are that. we talking about no, the cost? I'm talking runs. about for, for, the, for everyday Joe to get on the train. How much will oh, it Oh, right cost? now when we launch or when we open the system, it would be the same cost as what it costs for our bus riders. So right Which now. Which is, because I'm sorry. Right now it's a dollar. No, it's fine. I'm still the car driver. Right now it's a okay. dollar fifty one way um, okay. our cash fare is. And that'll be integrated into our pass system. So as long as our fare stay at dollar fifty, whatever our bus fare is going to be, that's what the light rail fare would be one way. And so once you get on, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of kind of the logistics. Mm -hmm. So you get on the train at, at <laughs> X stop mm -hmm. and say you want to take it to downtown. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that 150 Correct. all the way through. Then that again, that's that 150. If that's what we our bus um, fare is when we mm -hmm. open. So if we change, is that, there that integration changes. so that once you get off the train, if you need to transfer to a bus to keep going, mm -hmm. there will the be the line? upgraded bus feeder systems downtown. You might want to take the shuttle, take the net, or you might want to get on the ferry after you get off. So mm -hmm. to go to Portsmouth, you know, it's going to be intermodal. That's what our goal is to be fully intermodal as a mm -hmm. system. Let Bruce. me lay something else out that we may have forgotten, and you talk about people. Mm -hmm. When I was uh, in the fourth grade, and that's the can remember back, <laughs> in New York City, the way we, we, we I was on the lower east, on, on the east side, 
of, of, of Manhattan, on the west side of Manhattan, right near what they call Clinton Hell's Kitchen. Okay. And as a fourth grader, I knew where the Museum of Natural History was. I had been there several times, Hayden Planetarium as well. We had a bus pass. And the Thanks. teacher, when they took us, to, took us on the tour, mm -hmm. took us on the subway to the museum. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, how many Portsmouth kids do we have that have never been to the aquarium? How many kids in Virginia Beach have never been down to the Chrysler Museum? How many kids can we move around here to increase their educational capability by seeing the things we have in our own region mm -hmm. and are constrained because they can't get a school bus or they can't get there on their own unless mom takes them in the car or dad takes them in the car mm -hmm. or can't go with a group because they don't have a vehicle. Right. That's the piece that's not even being discussed in terms of the education of our children. So it really brings equality right. across, across economic, the board. That's why it's an economic justice issue. And on that note, we got to say goodbye. You guys are great. Thank, Thank you so you. much Thank for, for having you. us, so joining us to talk it. about this. Because I think it's just really important for us to kind of look at the people and what's involved with that. Mm -hmm. And I do want to let our audience know, too, that we did invite uh, someone from the Ingleside um, uh, neighborhood and also from the city of Norfolk, but at the last minute, they were unable to attend. So when we come back, the story of a local ophthalmologist on a mission to help those in Haiti. But first, here's what's happening in Hampton Roads. It's been almost three months since a devastating earthquake claimed hundreds of thousands of lives in Haiti and left much of the area in ruins. Since then, relief has poured in, and some of that help has come from right here in Hampton Roads. Lisa Godley recently spoke with a local eye doctor who's worked tirelessly to ensure that badly needed examination equipment gets to the people who need it most. When the earthquake in Haiti left so many with nothing, relief poured in. Among those eager to help was the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Within three days, the group had formed a task force to help. Their first step was to identify ophthalmologists who had some connection with Haiti, and Dr. Stephanie Mariano was one of them. I lived in Haiti when my father, William B. Jones, was the U.S. ambassador to Haiti. And so I was invited to join the task force and very honored to participate because I did really enjoy my stay in Haiti. She says while the task force was trying to determine how they might be the most effective, they started getting offers from ophthalmologists who wanted to donate equipment. But there was a problem. Our chair, Dr. Michael Brennan, said, oh, no, we can't, you know, it's too much. We can't ship it, transport it, and then get it to Haiti, pack it up. We don't have the funds. We can't do it. And I said, wait a minute. I said, the equipment is entirely too expensive to pass this up. The Haitians will have a difficult time trying to replace the equipment that they lost. So let me take this on and see if I can get some equipment shipped to Haiti. And they said, okay, we'll do it as a trial balloon. Dr. Brennan asked Dr. Mildred Olivier, a Haitian-American ophthalmologist in Chicago, to be her co-chair. And the two women have been on the move ever since. Dr. Olivier immediately contacted Kenneth Lombard, the owner of a local equipment company, and asked if he would make a donation. And boy, was he ready to help. Lombard Instrument, a Norfolk-based company that has helped with humanitarian efforts before, donated five complete rooms of equipment estimated at more than $100,000. All they have to do is put it in a room and plug it in and they have a turnkey examination because as an ophthalmologist we really cannot examine patients effectively without our equipment. Not only did Lombard Instrument donate the equipment but packed it and shipped it pro bono to Miami. That was just the beginning. The doctors kept making calls and the help kept pouring in. I contacted Physicians for Peace, Mr. Ken Hudson, and he donated through Physicians for Peace 14,000 pairs of new reading glasses. Imagine in an earthquake you lose your glasses, you can't read, you can't function. So we are so excited. He packed that up and shipped it down. And Allergan Pharmaceuticals was very generous in donating almost 10,000 bottles of prescription eye drops. And in the United States, they go for almost $100 a bottle. And 
and uh, it's not only for an antibiotics for infections, but also in the treatment of glaucoma, which is devastating in the Caribbean and in uh, countries of African descent. Thanks to several organizations, including the Clinton Foundation, the supplies were shipped to Haiti. So that equipment, the eyeglasses, the eye drops arrived in Haiti on Friday. So we are so excited. It is, we're having a little delays through customs, but it should be out in the community sometime this week, and we, we are just thrilled. The doctors have other large shipments of equipment, including the entire contents of a recently closed hospital that have been donated. Now they're seeking out the resources to get it packed and transported to Haiti, where it's most needed. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And if you'd like to donate equipment or help the task force get supplies to Haiti, log on to anotherview.tv and click on the links for Haiti Relief under this week's show. And while you're there, send us your comments about the show or sign up for our free eView newsletter. We thank you so much for joining us this week. And next week, the latest in treatment and diagnosis for prostate cancer. We'll see you next time for another view.